This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mary Bogiano is uh, an associate professor at uh, the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And uh, it, she's got this wonderful cross-sensitization uh, between the addiction to Oreos and stress. Uh, I liked it. <laughs> and, uh, and I'll let you give her, her story to you instead of spoiling it. Thanks, Mary. I am not an expert on stress. I'm still reading Mary Dahlman's papers to understand the physiology of stress. I just happened to run into stress um, in efforts to try to create the most veridical animal model of binge eating that I could. I myself um, have suffered from this disorder, first as a bulimic and then as a recovering binge eater. So I think that it's advantageous in the lab because students would say, Dr. Bajano, is this, is this binge eating? Like, no. Is this binge eating? No. But they're overeating. It's not binge eating. Is this binge eating? <laughs> yeah. So I kind of know when a rat is binge eating just intuitively. Let's see if I can get this work in here. Um, and Nicole already described, of course, what binge eating is. It, e it is eating a large amount of food in a discrete period of time, one to two hours. There's a sense of lack of control. There's the addictive part. Once the person begins eating that they just cannot stop. And it is very relevant to obesity because um, a lot of our obese population do suffer from BED. We figure about one third, and that's a lot of people. And interestingly, it's characteristic of most people that are in the morbid or super obese range. I think that's interesting. They, more of those people would qualify as binge eating disorder. Um, dieting is also, it's not talked about as much as in bulimia or anorexia, but dieting is also very common among these folks. And there's a paper out that says that they spend at least half of the, have, have spent half of their lives dieting. And I mentioned dieting because um, Hobel and Carr, I think, were one of the first pioneers that, that put food restriction and reward together. Food restriction augments reward. And we know this. Doesn't food taste great when we're hungry? It tastes better when we're hungry. Um, so we've known about that relationship. But it is really the addictive-like nature that defines binge eating. And I'm not saying that I can't explain um, frank obesity. And people do tell me, no, it does feel like an addiction, even though they don't have the exact same characteristics of, of BED. So I'm working with the animals who had an overarching hypothesis that binge eating is driven by changes in the brain's normal control of reward. And of course here specifically the control of reward. And what I've found through years of just trying to make stuff up and see what gets rats binge eating is wasn't that difficult. I look at what people do. A history of dieting and I'm, I'm beginning to get convinced that dieting itself is an internal stressor. I think Hans Selye would agree with me. Anything that rocks a steady state of conditions, whether it's um, an ugly boss or vacation or Christmas, is perceived by the brain as stress. Highly palatable food, critical in absolutely every experiment I'm going to show you. Um, of course, then external stress. Uh, it's coming from the outside. And I'll just touch on an inherent disposition and um, palatable food associated cues. But those two are going to deal with interaction of palatable food. This is one study. It was actually the first study that I ever published. I was an undergrad where I took female rats prepubertal and I restricted them a food antidote for a few days and let them refeed only on chow. I did that again three times in their lives. And then to probe for any perturbation in reward control of the brain, I used um, butorphanol, which is an opioid agonist, as a probe. Now, this drug alone um, <laughs> will increase food intake at higher doses, but here you see, and I'll tell you what the experiment was, these are animals that had no history of dieting, okay? Always had ad lib food. These animals did have a history of dieting, but I let them recover, and I never run a test on a hungry rat. Otherwise, it's a no-brainer. They're eating because they're hungry. Um, but I used a dose of butorphanol, an opioid agonist, that by itself, you can see, did not increase food intake the different colors of the bars at different times of eating. First hour, you can see all animals eat 
um, a good amount, and then of course it starts tapering off at the second and third hour. Even in an animals with a history of restriction, they looked absolutely normal if all you let them eat is chow and don't do anything but inject them with saline. But then animals that had the same history of restriction when given the same amount and, or dose of this opioid agonist continued to eat the second and third hour as if they hadn't even eaten the first hour. I call this a binge um, because theoretically they should be sated at this point. We don't go around injecting ourselves with butorphanol through the brain, right? What we do is we do get exposed to a more common rewarding stimulus, and here, of course, is palatable food, which we've been talking about all day. And by this, I mean foods that are high in fat, maybe saturated fat, refined sugar, and salts. Definitely very different from what our ancestors ate. Here's a, a common week's fare of food in the American family, and you can see how artificial it all looks, right? The color is, is just everything is artificial. If you look real closely, real closely. Those things are called grapes right there. That's the, the only natural food that I can find. Um, it's definitely not what, very different from what our ancestors ate. I can't quite make out what they're eating, but they seem to be enjoying it. It does not look like a Big Mac. I guarantee you that. Um, I add to this, so we know a little bit about history of dieting changing, possibly changing the brain's control of reward, but of course let's make it more uh, natural and add palatable food. And so what I did is basically the same experiment I did with butorphanol, except instead of using a drug, I used cookies. And here are the four different groups. Animals that never had a history of restriction that were given only chow, plain boring. Animals with no history of restriction and were given cookies once in a while. That was a lucky group, no dieting, cookies. Here, dieting only got to refeed on chow, here dieting and got to refeed on cookies. Of course, that's how we break our diets, isn't it? It's not on broccoli, it's on cookies. If I only then, and then what I did is I let them go for 44 days, no dieting, no palatable food in the cage. If you just look at the chow intake, when that's all that's in the cage, nothing happens. But once you reintroduce the palatable food, it's only this group that has a history of restriction and cookies that overeat. And this is, uh, I, I could get this every time that I put the palatable food in there for a greater total. This restriction is dieting because the people that most diet are our obese population. And uh, this willpower uh, explanation is absolute nonsense. It takes a lot of willpower to go from one diet to another, to another, to another that um, thin people don't do. Let's now add environmental stress. It's ubiquitous in our life. You can't, ex you can't escape environmental stress. And so to do this, I now used older rats, okay, not prepubescent, they were postpubescent, and did not restrict them as severely as I did that first experiment I showed you. So if we have four, four groups, three of them are really control groups. Animals with no dieting only, and um, no stress, no external stress. Animals that received no dieting but stress, and I used electric foot shock, very high intensity. It was very aversive, no damage to the rat, but extremely annoying, like a boss, like a bad boss. Um, then I had animals with a history of dieting, but no stress. And of course, the group that we're most interested in is history of dieting and stress. And we took them through cycles. Each cycle was 12 days long, and it looks like a busy slide. Just focus on the bright yellow, you see that the groups the history dieting groups were reduced to 66% of chow only for about five days and were allowed to refeed on cookies. Of course, everybody got the uh, Oreo cookies. At the time, they came out with double stuffed Oreos and the rats loved the middle much more than the outside. We didn't want to jip them of that fat, Kelly, you know? So we just said, <sighs> I've tried getting money from Nabisco. I don't understand why they don't fund me. You will understand in a minute. Um, and then I put in there good again. So we're gonna, you know, back to chow and no cookies. And then of course, those the stress groups got the foot shock. The other, the other rats just got to hang out in the foot shock alley with no shock um, delivered. So the, what was the feeding test then after stress or no stress on day 12? We put the animal back in the cage with ad libitum amounts of double stuffed Oreo cookies or chow. It doesn't matter where you place it. We, in different experiments, we, it was robust to whether you place it inside or outside the cage. Um, they'll always pull the cookie down through. And um, it, you can do it in the light cycle and the dark cycle, you st still get the same effects. I also, of course, made sure that those animals that had a history of dieting at this point were no longer hungry, we ran 24-hour chow tests, and um, 
were uh, the body weights were not significantly different from the other rats. So these are the results. And what's interesting is it always took three cycles. The first time, nothing happens. The second cycle, nothing happens. Third time is a charm. And we think that this is what the amount of time it takes for the brain to, um, or neuroadaptation to stress and dieting to occur because the animals that had the combination, well, first of all, you can tell what rats prefer cookies, all right? This is calories over here. Um, but they're eating a, a lot more than the other groups. And of course, with the same amount of stress and the same amount of um, the same type of history of dieting, it's not such a discrete period of time. It lasts 24 hours, and then we recycle them through another cycle. I like this slide because it shows the difference between normal overeating. These animals are hungry at the time that we tested them. Notice they eat more chow. Um, because uh, like humans, we eat nutritious food when we're really hungry. But here the question is, this is definitely not homeostatic eating. They're eating way more than they need to meet their caloric deficit. The question is, what is all this increased intake about? Interestingly, if we don't have food, palatable food in the cage during the test, they do not binge eat. It looks significant here, but it's not statistically significant. So they don't binge eat if there's nothing at home to trigger them, right? But as we know, a lot of binge eaters, of course, they'll find that one piece of Valentine's Day chocolate that somebody left, or maybe they forgot was in the fridge, and that can set off a whole binge. They get that one first bite, and it's like, oh, God, what else is in the house? And if it's midnight, they're not going to get in their car. They'll just continue eating on bread and cereal, whatever's there. Now, of course, this requires higher cognitive processing, right? And we have fancy words for them like um, cognitive disinhibition or, anyway, I'm not that kind of psychologist, I'm <laughs> the rat person. But we thought, well, let's see if rats do this. Will rats in rats just to buy a palatable food trigger binge eating on chow if that's all that's in the cage, right? See how smart these are, or I don't know. Maybe they can be as undisciplined as humans. And sure enough, when we did this, gave them a bite of chow, no difference between these three control groups. They over, the one group that had the interaction between dieting and stress did overeat on plain old boring rat chow, if first triggered by palatable food. And just to convince you that this is a binge, without the trigger, they were eating at most 15 calories. And here, they're eating double that. I think this is, this is kind of looks like lack of control. The animal is in there, it gets a bite of food, and it's uh, that yummy food, and it's like, yeah, where's the rest of it? Okay, there's chow. And so, I, you know, I, I am, am totally anthropomorphizing here, but hey, they did it, right? They did it. Um, after It's a long-lasting effect. If we keep cycling them, these animals do not habituate to the abnormal environment that is history of dieting and stress. Now what's really interesting is this is when I start rethinking about what is a history of dieting. Animals, we kept them on a formula where they only got, history of dieting animals only got the amount of chow that we calculated was 66% on the first cycle, okay? But eventually the control animals started kind of leveling off and not eating as much to the point where even on the last day of dieting, those rats were eating as much as the um, control animals. And my students would be telling me, Dr. Bajono, they're not restricting. They're not restricting. We gave them the same amount of food, but they weigh the same. They, it's not going to work. I said, that's okay. They think they're getting restricted. And this reminds me of Americans, right? It's like, well, if you're used to eating 3,000 calories a day or 2,800 calories a day, a healthy meal plan of 1,600 calories a day is going to feel like dieting, right? Um, so I think this is what may be happening with these rats. Um, I do have body fat uh, data on this. It's not on the slide for lack of time. We we're looking at different metabolic indices, and there was nothing that really stuck out uniquely in the in binge eating animals, except for court. Plasma corticosterone, which of course is a stress hormone. This is the one that was increased in um, the animals that were binge eating. A pharmaceutical company, I won't tell you which one, um, got the ex exact effect with this model. Only those rats with the interaction binged, and they also uh, found increased court levels. They had increased ACTH, another stress hormone, in both stress groups, but court uniquely in that one group that overeats. Um, other labs have taken this and done um, way better things than I ever did. For instance, Stefani et al. in Italy used a food teaser. They put the palatable food in a cup outside the cage so the rat could smell it, see it, um, and 
not eat it. <laughs> so that's very human-like. I was like, oh, it's there. Yeah, I kind of experienced that outside when I was using the bathroom. I wanted all those muffins. Um, so that can be a, it was a good stressor, and they got the same effects, increased court in the binge eating group. Um, Stephanie Hancock used maternal stress, take the kids, take the pups away from the moms, and that created the stress. So you can blame mom instead of foot shock, I guess, for the binge eating. And she used Reese's peanut butter pieces instead of Oreo cookies, still worked. Uh, exciting news is Consoloni et al. got it in mice. And so I say exciting because all the geneticists are like, yes, yeah, so now we can do genetic studies, right? We always need it in the mice. Uh, why are these rats binging, of course, the critical questions. Has this interaction changed the brain's control of reward? Is binge eating reducing stress? And may, might they be medicating uh, from depression or anhedonia caused by history dining, stress, palatable food, or all three? And now I'm thinking maybe this could be a withdrawal, a sign of withdrawal if they are depressed. Um, the answers to those questions were yes, yes, and yes, but only one of them. Evidence that history of dieting and stress alters reward signaling. We go in with naloxone as a probe for as its an opioid antagonist, and it is the binge eating group that was most responsive to the anorectic effects of this drug, where it had no effect here, no significant effect. This one, so this tells us that uh, a supersensitizing of the opioid receptors most likely by history of dieting and stress, so that they might um, become more stimulated by amphetamine or other drugs. Uh, what's interesting is that this block in the binge eating lasts for 24 hours. And we use naloxone, not naltrexone. Naloxone is out of the rat system between four to six hours. And so we thought, well, maybe the binge will come back when the drug is out of the system, and it did not. So if we block that reward signaling at the beginning, they don't binge at all. Um, we then used an opioid agonist, butorphanol and got the reverse effects. Animals that were binging had the most exaggerated response. It actually increased food intake than any other group. Um, could binging be lowering the animal stress? Uh, we do have some data. It's actually a different experiment where we had animals with no access to palatable food, just chow, intermittent access to, I believe it was Oreo cookies, my grad students work, and then daily access to palatable food. And you can see that stress hormones are decreased, at least here and here, in those rats that had palatable food. But of course, there's more beautiful and sophisticated studies done by Mary Dahlman and colleagues that show that, and others too, that palatable food drinks, um, just drinks alone, um, or food does decrease or blunt the HPA response to stress. Now, are they ameliorating depression by binge eating? Our first clue that it might be is that they respond to very differently to Prozac, right, which is an SSRI. They had the most exaggerated response to Prozac. You can see here, but you cannot ignore this other effect. It seems to be a main effect of a history of dieting. Right? So they were the most sensitive to this SSRI in terms of decreasing food intake. Uh, we did, ran some neurochemical tests and found that just rats with a history of dieting, whether they had the palatable food or not, had decreased levels of serotonin in the hypothalamus. In the medial prefrontal cortex, which is more involved not in satiety but um, control of mood, we saw decreased levels of monomines, dopamine and serotonin, in animals with a history of dieting. And then in a rewarding area of the brain, nucleus accumbens, we kept getting this really strange relationship. And I think I, w I actually called Hobel and asked him if he uh, could understand this, because I couldn't. But we kept getting it over and over. There is also very n always a nice interaction between the turnover of dopamine and serotonin in the nucleus accumbens in control animals, which is completely abolished if the animal had a history of dieting. Keep in mind, there's no hunger involved here or change in body weight. We kept getting this over three different experiments. Um, thought it was interesting and what we found furthermore is that really it didn't matter whether they had exposure to palatable food or not. As long as they had a history of dieting, this relationship was abolished. So taken together, it might appear that these rats are indeed depressed. And this test didn't work too well for us. Um, but we did run other more classic depression tests. One, ironically, is um, giving them a dilute solution of, of a sucrose intake. And um, the animals with history dieting actually showed anhedonia, meaning reduced intake. Maybe they needed it to be sweeter to drink more of it. They also um, interacted less with a novel object. And then, of course, the gold standard for to find out whether a rat is depressed or not is the forced swim test. They hate to do this. A happy animal will struggle. 
and try to get out of it. History of dieting rats um, showed less struggling. So just to show you what I mean, this is an animal that is quite content. It's not happy it's in the water, but it, it is not depressed, all right, like in the clinical sense or the neurochemical sense. It, you can see the splashing around the water. It's actively even trying to find an escape route. You know, where's the exit? In contrast, animals with just that history of dieting, which again was not severe, the normal body weight, you can see that the waters are very still. They're just floating. They're just floating. And all they do is keep their nose up above water. If there's any movement, it's just to keep themselves from drowning. You know, drug companies go in and inject them with antidepressants and they act like the other rats. Um, already told you. Okay, just I'll just touch, I know I'm running out of time, on inherent differences in reactions to palatable food. In working with the rats, we always noticed that there were some rats that seemed to always eat more food when palatable food was around, okay? If all they had was chow, you'd see no differences between rats. But then if you introduce things like cookies, the high fat and high sugar, there was always a group that consistently ate 40 to 50 percent more. And so we dubbed these rats binge eating prone and binge eating resistant. And you can see how much more of the palatable food the BEVs eat. If we go in and stress these animals, again, with foot shock, now a normal lab animal will decrease its food intake when you're stressed. That's a normal, these animals don't have a history of dieting. But what was interesting is in the resistant rats, the binge resistant rats, stress decreased the amount of junk food they ate. Whereas in the binge eating prone rats, stress decreased the nutritious food. They would not forsake their junk food. Now I'm thinking this may be a problem over time. Um, just to show you that this is not an Oreo Nabisco effect, uh, we did, uh, th they did increase their food intake to other foods such as a plain high fat pellet. Fruit Loops is interesting because it's uh, no fat, high sugar, and the BEPS did eat more of that. Crisco is interesting, all fat, no sugar, the BEPS ate more of that. Oreo like pellet, of course. Chow to show you that they look totally normal until you put pal palatable food in the cage. Candy corn was a uh, real stumper. It's like, what? It didn't work. It didn't work with candy corn. And later, actually just the other day, I realized, huh, this rules out something called delayed negative allostasia. If you're interested in knowing what that is, ask me a question because I can't talk about it right now. Um, this, this, I think, is very addictive. Like, BAPs were more willing to cross incrementing levels of foot shock. All right, at this point, the animals are screaming. They're vocalizing. They hate it. They don't like it. This reminds me of Stanley Milgram, remember? increasing levels of shock and clearly more BEPs or BEPs made more retrievals and this time for M&Ms. Despite consequences, that sounds familiar. More BEPs, just the same graph really, but to show you that more BEPs than burrs were willing to cross incrementing levels of foot shock. Uh, there's also preliminary data on these animals that they tend to be more impulsive addiction. Um, I showed this talk at, at NIMH and, and Susan, how do we know these aren't just obese prone animals? Great question. Um, so what we did is we placed both groups on a high fat, chronic high fat diet when that's all they had to eat. And um, what we found is that exactly 50% of the binge resistant group got obese on that diet, 50% didn't. 50% of the prone rats got obese, 50% died. This means we can completely dissociate. They are independent factors. Binge eating does not predict obesity. And we know this, right? We have normal weight or even underweight binge eaters um, in the human population. So we're thinking that some clinical parallels might be represented by these differences, right? Whereas like the healthy individual does not binge, does not, is obese resistant. Um, bulimia nervosa, of course, they binge, but they're also obese resistant. Well, they don't, the rats aren't vomiting or taking laxatives, but they are compensating. And the way that these animals on a chronic high fat diet resist obesity is they, they somehow detect the increase in calories or energy of every bite and they decrease their own amount of food that they eat. Whereas the obese prone rats continue to eat the same volume of chow, but now it's a high energy food, and they don't adjust downwards, so that's why they become obese. Uh, frank obesity is more represented by no binge eating, but obesity proneness, and of course BED, who both binge and are obesity prone, and hopefully we can start looking at some genetic work with this model to try to tease out. Environmental cues are really huge in drug addiction. We pay a lot of respect to cues. 
um, to trigger cravings, et cetera, and we have so many of them. And we have so many of them by the food industry. Uh, one cue, sadly, can just be our own refrigerators. You know, you come home, what's the first thing you do? Open the refrigerator, like, not even hungry. But it's a cue, and what we ask is, could we condition rats to overeat on plain old lab chow if they're in a queue or a place where they're used to overeating on Oreo cookies. So we set this up. The only queue we used is bedding. Different kinds of bedding smell differently, um, look differently, feel differently. Half the rats got Oreo cookies here and chow here. Half the rats got Oreo cookies here and chow here. And my students would report to me that I'm allergic to rats, so I don't directly work with them. I just do the thinking. And uh, my students would tell me they knew, the rats knew when they were going into the cookie cage. And there's no cookies there, just the cue. They would just whoo, almost leap out of their hands. They just got very energized. So the test then is, you know, will we, if we place the rats in the cookie cage, but with only chow, will they overeat? Well, the results were <clears throat> bummer, no difference. So when the rats were put in the cookie cage, they ate as much as when they were put in their, their chow cage. But let's go ahead and prime them like we do with, uh, in drug addiction. You can prime an animal. This time we'll do it with palatable food. We gave them a piece of Oreo cookies when they were both in the cookie cage, uh, just one piece of cookie in the cookie cage and in the chow cage. Here we get differences. It looks complicated, but really this is all that's happening. When rats were put in the chow cage, they ate, this is the amount of calories due to the Oreo primer, and they ate this much more chow. This graph is not statistically different from these. However, if you look at this one, here's animals, they're eating this much of the Oreo calories, this much chow, but oh, I gotta have more, and they continue eating. What this tells me is they're in an environment that is cued they're less likely to regulate their calories, okay? All right, so conclusions. I've got all kinds of lessons. I know I'm running out of time, but I think we need to look at these, this, the binge, or rather the palatable food as a real biochemical effect. And I, I know therapists say that this helps their clients when they say, you know what, rats do this. It's like, oh, so it must be my biology, it must be, you know, something I can't help. Um, and although view, it's viewed as forbidden food, uh, because of their caloric content, et cetera, we've got to look at biochemical reasons to take precautions around how we reintroduce these foods, at least in treatment. And in some of us, just access to palatable food may trigger gene and food type interaction. You never know what genes you have. So if you're predisposed, anybody in that range may actually go over to food addiction, okay? Um, and then we can see that palatable food can be as easily conditioned to cues as drugs, and we definitely need to pay more attention to these cues. Um, stress can interact in a unique fashion with a history of dieting, not even just not, not very, just real mild dieting to change the brain's control of reward. And then we need to emphasize stress management um, techniques, but also recognize that stress alone is not the culprit. It's these interactions between palatable food or history of dieting. Uh, this is my drug company slide. Um, it's different uh, drug targets that are obviously suggested by the data. Um, skip over that. Lots of students, wise consultants, and colleagues. And you know, I keep wanting to put Nabisco down there, <laughs> but it's just not going to happen. I'll leave you with that slide. Thanks, guys. Questions. <laughs>